type of medicine that trains your body to fight any foreign agents. Plants are helpful for the ecosystem. It's an electronic device for storing and processing data. The nervous system is all the collection of nerves in your body. Yeast is a eukaryote. Welcome to Spectacular Science, where it's all about science, with your host, Akshay. Ah! I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm awake. Oh, hey there, listeners. Welcome back to this episode of Spectacular Science. I'm your host, Akshay. Oh, that was a good night's sleep. Let's see what time it is. It's already 11 a.m. Oh, no, I need to get this day started. You know, ever since I've been out on summer break and school is let out, I my sleep schedule and my eating schedule have been really messed up. And I learned that it's because of something called circadian rhythm, or your body's internal clock. But I want to learn more about it. Hmm, who should I talk to? Oh, I know. I should talk to Dr. Aaron Gibson. Dr. Aaron Gibson is a circadian biologist and assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the Stanford Center for Sleep and Circadian Sciences at Stanford University. She's a great person to talk to because she knows a lot about circadian rhythm or your body's internal clock and what role it plays in your lives. Come on, let's go. Hi, Dr. Gibson. Hi. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? I'm doing great. But the only thing that's not great is my messed up sleep schedule. (laughs) I'm on summer break right now and oh, I get a lot of sleep and I stay up uh, late and then wake up early in the morning. So my sleep schedule is really messed up and that causes my eating schedule to be messed up as well, which I'm not really that happy about because I love eating. Yep. That those two things can go hand in hand. Yep. So I wanted to talk to you about circadian rhythm, and I know that that's your body's internal clock, but I want to learn more about it from you. Sounds good. All right, let's get started. So first of all, can you please introduce yourself to the listeners? Yes, I am Dr. Aaron Gibson. I am an assistant professor at Stanford University in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the Center for Sleep and Circadian uh, Sciences. Wow, nice. So how did you get interested in science? I was an, a kid who knew I wanted to get into science from the age of eight years old. Um, I oddly told my parents at eight, I was going to end up a professor in biology somewhere. <laughs> um, and just kind of always had a passion for biology and science and asking questions and experimenting. And I was lucky I actually got to work in a salmonella vaccine lab when I was in high school at Washington University in St. Louis, which is where I'm from. Um, So I got the research bug pretty early. And then I fell into neuroscience when I did my undergrad at Duke University. Um, And then I got into uh, circadian rhythms during my PhD um, at University of California, Berkeley, and have sort of carried it on uh, through Uh, my career and then my lab sort of now focuses on sort of circadian biology and sleep rhythms and and, um, the role that non-neuron cells in the brain, so all the cells in your brain that aren't neurons, uh, play in regulating um, sleep. Whoa, that is so cool. So let's get started on the questions about circadian rhythm. So what is circadian rhythm in humans? Yeah, so the circadian system is actually like a hierarchy of little biological clocks, um, and they start at the level of the cell. So virtually every cell in your body, from your brain cells to your skin cells to your heart cells, your liver cells, have these little tiny clocks in them, um, and they are they're created and they function in a twenty four hour fashion. And they do this through, um, you know, transcribing genes and creating proteins. And then those proteins will actually feed back uh, within the cell and turn off their own production. And so that loop actually takes about 24 hours. So even at the cellular level, we have these little 24 hour clocks. And then 
whole organ systems, like whole your liver, your heart, your skin um, can oscillate on a 24 hour clock because you have a principal brain clock. You have a, ma- a major clock in your brain in a part of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN for short. And what that brain clock does is it cor- kind of acts like a conductor in the orchestra, in an orchestra. So if, if you imagine that every cell in your body was a, 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 a member of an orchestra playing a different instrument, but with the same sheet music, and if you let them all just play that music on their own pace, it wouldn't sound very good because some people would play it a little faster, some people a little slower. And that's essentially what happens in our cells. They all oscillate on approximately a 24 hour cycle, but not exactly. And so you need a conductor to send cues to all of those cells to make sure that they stay in phase with one another. And that's essentially what this brain clock does in the SCN is it sends either signal signals throughout the brain and the body, either f- through hormone secretion or through actual neural connections to make sure that those cells everywhere else stay in phase with one another. And then we as organisms can entrain or synchronize all of these clocks in our body to the external environment um, and the 24-hour cycle that we know exists with the light-dark schedule here on Earth um, through light-dark information. So light-dark information um, will enter through the eye and it gets also sent to this clock in the brain um, through a, a circuit called the retinohypothalamic tract. And it'll send lighting information to the SCN so that then the SCN can say, okay, it's daytime. There's a lot of light. As a human, that means we want to eat. It's not, It's dark. For a human, that means we want to sleep. And so you can then co- coordinate these sort of internal circadian rhythms with the external 24-hour environment. That's fascinating. So many different things. And every single cell in my body has its own biological clock, which is just awesome to think about. Yeah. So what aspects of our lives does this rhythm control? Um, The better question is what doesn't it control? It pretty (laughs) much controls everything. Um, So everything from your sleep-wake cycle to when you want to eat um, to your metabolism digestion, urine production, your your heart rate and your body temperature actually oscillate over a 24-hour cycle. So your, wow. your body temperature lowers while you sleep and it raises when you're awake. Your blood pressure also os- oscillates over a 24-hour cycle. Um, urine production, so you, you don't get up and go to the bathroom all night long. <laughs> your body knows to, to, to allow you to sort of produce less urine, hold on to your urine longer. Um, and that's all controlled by these 24 hour rhythms. Wow. That's a lot of stuff controlled by these rhythms. So do other animals have circadian rhythms besides humans? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of why circadian rhythms are so important is because they are so evolutionarily conserved. So everything from cyanobacteria, little bacteria up to humans um, exhibit these 24 hour circadian rhythms. And and, uh, some of the most seminal work in this field was done in fruit flies Um, that people who discovered these sort of molecular clocks actually did a lot of their work in, in fruit flies and they actually won the Nobel prize for this. Um, and so, and it makes sense because the idea is that we want our physiology, all the things that have to happen in our body in order for us to function as organisms, we want the, those processes to happen at the right time of day. We don't want them all happening simultaneously. We don't have enough energy for that. And so we want to make sure they happen at the right time of day. And so it makes sense that anything that's lived, that's evolved to live in, uh, in earth, on earth uh, would have evolved these rhythms in order to make sure that we we sort of uh, we we function more efficiently with our environment. Wow, that is amazing! From bacteria all the way to giant humans, is such a diverse population that has the circadian rhythm. It's just it's just it's just amazing to think about it. Yeah, it's pretty important. So I have a question for you: How do I um how do I get my sleep cycle and my um eating cycle back on track? Because let me tell you. This summer break has really got my sleep cycle out of whack. Yeah. So, I mean, the you know, um, schedules are really important in these things. And, and there's a couple of sort of tricks you can do 
um, to sort of help your body stay what we call circadian aligned. So making sure that your, your circadian rhythms are aligned properly with the external environment. And that's really important because when we say your circadian misaligned, when your internal rhythms don't match up with the environment, that's when you can feel really bad. And most people have felt this way when they've been jet lagged, right? So if you fly across um, the country or you fly, you know, from the U.S. to Europe, we've, you know, people have all experienced what it feels like to be jet lagged. And usually it's you're tired, you might be a little foggy, your memory might not be as good, your digestion, digestion um, usually gets dysregulated. Um, and so we know that when we become misaligned, it's not good. And oftentimes we, we live, unfortunately, now in a 24-hour light uh, society. So when industrialization happened and we, we as a species now could access light 24 hours a day, that light cue to tell our body what time of day it is no longer became as informative. And so in many ways, a lot of us are now what we call circadian disrupted. Um, so what that means is that the, the external cues that used to help us time ourselves and, and synchronize our bodies to the environment don't provide the same level of information anymore. And so whether it's your chronically jet lag because you're a pilot or a flight attendant or just travel a lot for work, or if you're a shift worker, people who work nights, um, they are now also out, sort of out of phase with the environment. Um, or if you're just a normal kid <laughs> who is on summer break and now you're staying up later than you used to, and you might be either getting up too early and not getting enough sleep, or you might be sleeping in too late. Um, all of those things can sort of dysregulate you. And so sort of uh, schedules are really important. And that's what we try to, to emphasize. So trying to go to bed at the same time of day and waking up at the same time of day. Depending on how old you are, the amount of sleep you might differ, but on average, you want somewhere about seven to, to nine hours of sleep, and you want that to be consistent. Some things you can do to help maintain that consistency is getting really bright light in the morning is actually really good for you. Um, so most people have heard of melatonin, mm -hmm. uh, which is this sleep aid, or it's, it's coined as a sleep aid. It's actually not a sleep aid. Um, in humans, we think it's a sleep aid because melatonin is controlled by a circadian clock and it increases at night and it decreases during the day. But that's also true for a nocturnal species. So like oh. mice, and rats, they also have melatonin high during the dark phase and low during the active phase, but those species are actually active during the dark phase. They, so they're not sleeping when their melatonin is really high. So what melatonin really is, is a timing cue. And the reason for that is because light that enters your eye actually inhibits the production of melatonin. And so for, if you naturally, your melatonin starts rising at night or in the evening, and it it increases its its elevation it increases its levels during the dark phase while you're sleeping but if you were to actually go into the bathroom and turn your light on it would actually suppress melatonin really quick oh. and so when you're up really late at night and you're watching TV or you're on your iPad um that light is actually inhibiting your melatonin from rising properly oh no and so that that set, that tells your body it messes up the signal to your body about what time of day it is. So bright light in the morning is really great because it helps to really suppress that melatonin, get you going, activating you um, to get going for the day. So having bright light in the morning when you first wake up is great. And then trying to minimize light exposure at night so that that melatonin can start elevating and keeping that, that, that timing cue um, around is really important. So so things like schedule, bright light in the morning, um, less light at night are all really important things in order to, to sort of maintain your circadian health. Wow, those are some great tips. I'm definitely going to use them tonight because I really want to get my sleep schedule back on track or else I'm just really tired in the morning and then stay up all night. Yep. So what advice do you have for kids who are interested in science? Um, I think just ask questions, you know, the job of a scientist is to actually not know everything. It's to, it's to acknowledge that you don't know a lot 
And that's exciting because that means you have a lot of questions to ask. And that means you have a lot of experiments to run. Um, And so being okay with not knowing things and not having the answer is at the heart of being a scientist. And I think that's a, that's hard for a lot of kids because I, I have two kids myself. I have a seven and nine year old, two daughters. And, and, you know, when you go to school, you're expected to learn a lot and do a lot and know a lot, and you get tested on that, but you actually learn more from what you don't know. Right. Well, and so being okay with not having all the answers is a really important point, really important coin, cornerstone to being a scientist. And as a kid, it's great. Ask a lot of questions, admit you don't know things, ask people who might know those answers more, kind of like you're doing right now is a really important thing. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in science, um, science fairs, you know, a lot of labs at universities will take on high school students who may want to work in a lab for a summer. So reaching out to, to professors to see if they have any summer programs is great. Give them some time because it often takes a few months mm-hmm. to get get people on board. Um, but those sorts of things are all really important. And the other the other biggest thing about science is failure happens all the time. Experiments fail. Uh, grants don't get funded. Um, papers might get rejected from being published, um, and that's okay. Um, it's a normal part of life. And knowing that you actually generally learn more from failure than you do from success. And so be okay with failure. It's part of the process. That's some great advice. Thank you so much for talking to me today. I really enjoyed it. And I learned so much about circadian rhythm and how it works. I'm again going to use those tips for tonight because it will really help me. Good. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Spectacular Science. Spectacular Science is produced and hosted by me, Akshay J. Raman. Our theme song is by Charan Ramachandran. Thank you so much, Dr. Gibson, for accepting this interview invite. I learned so much about circadian rhythm, and I had so much fun. I also loved those great tips you gave me on how to catch up with my sleep schedule and my eating schedule. Thank you so much. Please visit my podcast website, SpectacularSci.com, to find interactive activities, articles, and blog posts. That's SpectacularSci.com. Please also subscribe wherever you're listening right now. It really encourages me to keep making new episodes and supports the show, and it also keeps you up to date on all the episodes that are going to be released. Please subscribe or follow wherever you're listening. Thank you so much for all your support. This is the end of Season 5 of Spectacular Science. Woohoo! And we'll be back with new episodes of Season 6 on August 1st, 2023. That's new episodes on August 1st, 2023. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you on the next season of Spectacular Science, premiering on August 1st, 2023. In the meanwhile, you can stay up to date with our YouTube channel and subscribe. We'll be posting interactive and DIY experiments that you can do at home. Follow our YouTube channel and subscribe for more. Thank you so much for listening to this episode, and we'll see you on the next season on August 1st, 2023. Keep thinking about science!